Thank you. What a fun day. Is everybody having fun? Yes? Right. Fabulous response. Okay. I'm going to talk about what I believe anyway may be the most awesome achievement of humanity, for better or for worse, the creation of extraordinary amounts of data and information. And it's fair to say, as you'll see in a moment, uh, that we're producing a heck of a lot of it, but there's a catch. What do we do with it, and how do we make sense of it? And I'm going to talk specifically about biodata, because that's the realm that I work in, uh, just a small subset. So first, though, I'm going to ask you a question. And I don't think you saw this one coming when you saw the title of the talk. When was the first steam engine invented? Anybody know? Was it the 1600s? 1700s? 1870. The 1800s? What if I told you it was 70 AD in ancient Rome? This fellow here named Hero was a Greek living in Alexandria, which was the great center of learning in that time. And he actually invented a working steam engine. Now, it was a little toy. It didn't really do very much. It was a ball that actually just spun around. But he did get the idea of hooking this up to a ship. Now, we know from our history that this never really amounted so much in ancient Rome. And we have to wait another 1,700 years, in fact, until this gentleman, Thomas Newcomb, in 1722, invented a working steam engine, which he's holding in the statue here, which was a device that cleared water out of mines. And the reason I'm telling this story in the reference uh, of bio data and big data is that the British knew what to do with this little invention, this innovation, if you will. Uh, the Romans did not. And of course, the rest is history. And my question for you is we're thinking about data here, and I'm about to plunge into the big data question is are we the Romans? Or the British. And yes, I did not borrow this from Sid Meier's civilization. Okay, so the central message here is that creating data is easy, actually. I mean, you don't always think of this, you have to wrap around this, like, especially in our part of the world here, uh, Silicon Valley, very close to Silicon Valley. Uh, creating the devices, the machines, the technology has become extraordinarily easy for us in the time that we're living in now. Making sense of it, though, is hard, especially with bio data, but I would argue that pretty much any data uh, is hard to make sense of when you're producing it, the quantities we are. And to give you an idea of that, the total data in the world being pr produced per day right now is 2.5 exabytes. That's 10 to the 18th power. And this is, a, by the way, an IBM study that just came out. Now, that's an extraordinary amount of data. In fact, so extraordinary that we have produced 90% of all data since the beginning of human history in just the last two years. So think about that. This is all the data on the planet right now, 1.8 zettabytes. And I put all the zeros up there. And in another six years, in 2018, uh, we will have six times this data, over seven zettabytes of data. So, switching over here to bio data, which is a subset of this, um, you know, we can talk about Facebook and hear about these other, other aspects of data. But this is where, to me, it gets the most interesting because bio's been a little late to the game, a little late to the party, but it's catching up rapidly. This is a, a chart that my friend um, um, Eric Schatt from Pacific Biosciences loaned me. And it shows you that throughout history we produce data, but not much. And in fact, in 2000, we had 10 gigabytes of data in bio. That was it, 10 gigabytes. In 2008, at the top of this chart, we're, we're going through the petabyte barrier, and now we're you know, rapidly approaching exabytes of data just in bio alone. You can see all the different types of, of data on the chart there, everything from imaging to digitized medical records. Uh, to bore down a little bit, the number of human genomes sequenced, which produces a lot of data, we're probably closing in on around 25,000 entire, this is all the DNA in a single human being. And this was very expensive even two or three years ago. In fact, three or four years ago, it was over a million dollars. It's now down probably, it could hit $1,000 per genome this year. We only had a handful of these things just a few years back. So just think about this for a second. The entire planet is sequenced, all DNA on the planet, seven billion people, if we did it for everybody right now. That would be hundreds of zettabytes. Don't you love these names? Zettabytes of data just 
for genetic sequencing. Now, you add all of the other types of bio data, and you begin, I'm just going to throw this at you here, genetics, proteomics, uh, scanning technologies, all the pharma data, nanotech, um, digitized medical records that your doctor is beginning to use, hopefully, um, all the various devices that measure things, and the whole quantified self movement, etc., all the different apps that are literally thousands, having an explosion of, of medical apps right now, and that just gives you a, a small taste of all of the data that's being produced. But my interest is obviously personal, as it should be for you. Uh, what's going on with this data for me, for my family? This is my parents and my son. And these people are very important to me. And you all have people who are important to you. And what is all this data doing to help us figure out our health, and especially our health future? And I tend to focus on the predictive and preventive side of the health equation and what technology can do for us before we get sick. And as uh, Jennifer said in the beginning, I have spent the last several years as a journalist writing about this technology by trying it out of myself. It was a little bit of a test drive, if you will, or consumer reports of all the stories I'm writing about, what does it really mean? And so it's basically a personalized study on massive data, which we call the Experimental Man Project. And just, I'm going to give you just a very quick little overview. There's obviously, well, there's a lot of data. Uh, thousands of tests, hundreds of labs and companies all over the world. Uh, I have had my full genome scanned. Uh, 22,000, I think we're actually having like 25,000 traits identified now. Um, hundreds of environmental toxin levels. I did a National Geographic story on this a few years back where I tested myself with levels of environmental toxins and where I might have been exposed, including here in the Bay Area. Um, MRI brain scans, hours and hours, uh, proteomics, microbiomics, it just goes on and on and on. Um, in fact, you can read about it at experimentalman.com, uh, that's the book right there. Um, so the gist of this all is that we've created about 500 gigabytes of data on just a single person, which happens to be me. And I showed you a minute ago what would happen if we sequenced everyone's DNA on the planet. Well, imagine that we had all of this data that I've collected on everyone on the planet. And then you're going to get into something called Yodabytes. Yodabytes? I don't even know who comes up with these names. And I had to stick Yoda in there. I apologize. But anyway, may the force be with us to be able to handle all this data. Um, so to give you a little sample of this information, and now we're moving away from the data collection into what this might mean. So this is the kind of information, interpretive information I'm getting. Um, some of the genetic information out of those 22,000 plus uh, markers, I have a slightly elevated risk for heart attack. And I can tell you that I don't really understand what that means. 20%, that's a 20% above the average risk, which is already about 40% for a guy my age. Uh, and it's also from fairly preliminary studies that haven't exactly been validated clinically. So does that mean I'm going to get a heart attack or not? Who knows? Um, Empathy, these are my favorite ones. The uh, DNA behavioral test is just for all kinds of things. Apparently, I have a high risk for having low empathy. <laughs> but I don't really care what you think. <laughs> Alzheimer's, but if I did, you know, care, I would forget about it. Or at least I wouldn't forget about it because I have very little trace of Alzheimer's in my brain. Um, there is an interesting test, and this one is a fairly good test. It has some validation about uh, they can detect Alzheimer's in your future uh, by, by doing an MRI brain scan. It's very expensive, so it's not typically done, but even before sy symptoms show. So that's one that actually is kind of interesting. Uh, thank God I don't have any trace of it at the moment, anyway. Uh, greed, they also have these behavioral tests. When you stick your head in the MRI, they start having to play all these games that supposedly can tell if you're greedy or altruistic. I came out normal in greed. What does that mean? I don't know. Normal greed? Um, proteomics, uh, they test, test, tested my, uh, my blood, proteins in the blood to see if there's any trace of potential cancer in my future. Thankfully not, uh, at least at this point. Um, and just one of the many chemicals I was tested for, DDT, I also have PCBs, uh, metals, pretty much everything. Uh, I grew up in eastern Kansas. And when I was a little kid, we used to ride around behind the DDT truck that sprayed every year for mosquitoes. We'd ride in and out of the cloud like we were really brave. And I ended up with, you know, a lot of DDT still in my body all these years later. But again, what does this mean? It's still parts per billion 
And is this dangerous or not? We don't really know. So this is the beginnings of the interpretation of all this data. Some of it's interesting and useful, some of it still needs a lot of work. My favorite genetic mark, and for those of you, how many of you can drink coffee right before you go to bed and not feel it? Okay, I can't really see you, but I assume it's probably about 25% because genetically that's the way it should be. The caffeine fast metabolizer gene is what you have. It means that you can just drink the stuff all day, all night, and you don't really feel that little bump because your body doesn't process the caffeine. Um, I'm going to do a little deep dive here for a second just to show you my progression for one aspect of data and how I personally have been trying to solve this and some others that I'm working with. Uh, this is around mercury exposure. And almost all the mercury that gets inside of humans um, gets there through coal and burning coal in power plants. It gets in the atmosphere. Uh, this is a satellite image, a NASA image. Uh, that's China, Korea. Uh, the clouds of pollution are blowing, guess where? Towards us here in California. And the mercury's in that cloud. You can't see it, but it's, it drops into the ocean. It's absorbed by plankton. It gets into the food chain where little fish eat the plankton, and it moves up the food chain. So what I did here in the experimental man context was I went out and caught a fish. Actually, I had the balenas. And it wasn't this fish, though. This fish is a lot bigger than the one I caught. <laughs> I couldn't actually find a picture small enough. Uh, but this is a halibut. And I then went to the ferry building in San Francisco, where I live, uh, to get a swordfish steak. That was a little easier to do. And I cooked them up for lunch and dinner. And then did a before and after mercury level test. So my before was four parts per billion, which actually is quite high. It's about twice the national average. I don't really eat a lot of fish, which is the main source of exposure. Uh, note that it's still very small amounts to parts per billion. Uh, but it is below the EPA safety threshold of 5.8. So I thought, okay, I'm okay, right? But then I had my fish meal. Guess what? 13 parts per billion. I spiked up way above that EPA threshold. And that was just from those two meals. Now that's interesting data, right? Maybe you don't eat fish, large fish. And I do encourage you to eat fish because it's good for you. But the larger fish are the ones that have the high levels of mercury. But I took this a step further in the experimental man project and, and tried to combine it with genetics. So I discovered, much to my surprise, that there's actually a lot of work being done on this. And in fact, there's a little bit of technical data here, but you can see that there's several genes involved with one's sensitivity to mercury. It's like an allergy. Some people have allergies, some people don't. Some people have a sensitivity to various toxins, and some don't. And you can see there's a little red C there on the GC, a gene called BDNF. It has to do with effects on cognition and mood. And I don't know, when you, and I'm slightly high risk for that. And when you combine that with a lack of empathy, bad moods, I don't know, maybe you should just stay away. Um, <laughs> And in fact, we're taking this even a step further and started a little company uh, around genetic testing for mercury. And we'll be telling you about this in the fall, uh, but we're working on a lot of other toxins as well. And this is basically putting my money, so to speak, where my mouth is, although there's really good money in startups, at least at this point, in the progression of the company. All right, some of the challenges in making sense of this data. Um, it has to be validated. I hope that you've gotten a little hint here in this, in this very quick summation of some of my data uh, that much of it has not been useful. In fact, the vast majority of those 500 gigabytes has actually not enlightened yet. It's been kind of cool and interesting, but it hasn't told me all that much. And this part is not fun. It's not sitting around at Google and you know, dreaming up the next search engine or something. This is all about uh, clinical validation, lots of things that are not that exciting. The regulation and the, the whole political uh, situation is rather muddled. Uh, there's the issue of keeping people healthy rather than, keep, than treating them when they're sick. And there's also a curious gap between IT and biomedicine, because the biomedical people are really catching up with IT, and neither party quite gets the other one yet, although it's beginning to happen. So more experiments. Uh, this is my proteomic scan. We're doing more of that. Lots of correlated work, trying to combine data. Um, this is a, a stem cell line that was created. I sent my blood into the lab. They bioengineered it into stem cells, which can grow into any cell in my body. And I just did a technology review piece on this if you want to check it out. And they created these little guys. As you see, they're moving, they're beating. These are heart cells for me that were grown from my stem cell line. So more experiments, more data. Um, and this is a little depiction also from Eric Schatt of where we're all headed with this. I mean, that should be just a fraction of what's going on here, all the things going on in the human body. You can imagine the data that, 
that's uh, being generated, thrown off, or will be by all of that. So what's needed here? We obviously need a new mindset where, okay, enough of the data, now let's figure out what it means. And that's a pretty profound shift in our thinking. And I actually challenge you all to start thinking about that, especially those of you that are going into any field that I've been, been talking about here. Uh, we need a revolution in interpreting tools. And it's not just you know, creating a lot of hardware and software, it's, it's also methods. How do we actually test 22,000 genetic traits? You can't do a double blind control study on every one of those. It would be too expensive for one thing, and it would take decades to do. So how are we going to fix that? Um, need a radical shift in resources. The NIH right now, National Institutes of Health, spend only 4% on translational medicine. The rest is basically creating data. And I think there needs to be almost a reversal of that to figure out what's going on here. And this, for you all who are in college and figuring out what you may want to do here, we're going to need 500 million analysts, according to CDI, in just six years. And there are only about 100 million of them now. And these are people um, you know, who, who understand algorithms, statistics, and can really make sense of a lot of this data. So the thing is, as I'm talking about all the problems and challenges here, it is beginning to happen. And this is where it gets exciting. You, Probably many of you go to meetings or hear about uh, a lot of the new developments that are happening in trying to interpret this data. And I'm just going to throw up a few of the groups uh, that I'm aware of uh, Medicine 2.0, Health 2.0, the DNA Network, Quantify Itself, uh, Sage Bio Networks, which is a nonprofit that's trying to tie together data and make sense of all of it. Um, and then, of course, you have Watson and various uh, big companies that are trying to wrestle down this data. Watson, we know from Jeopardy, but they're turning it loose on all this medical data now, so we'll see what happens. But in the end, I just want to come back to, it's really about us as individuals and people. And of course, one of the issues with data and technology is the dehumanizing part of it. And we will not be doing our job with this challenge if we don't remember uh, people like my mom and dad, my son, uh, others that are meaningful to us. And my challenge to you is to not be like the Romans, to be like the British. Thank you very much. <laughs>